Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome uh, to all, all of you that have joined us today. Uh, we have a record number of people with us uh, who all seem very eager to find out more about uh, residency and citizenship by investment opportunities for African nationals. Uh, I'm also very pleased to welcome Don Barnes, Director of Client Advisory and Finance, and Alex Hopkin, St Strategic Director for Latitude, who are absolute experts in this field. Uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, my name is Jared Jacklin. I'm a private wealth manager for the Carrick Group, a leading and multi-award winning offshore private wealth advisory firm. And we bring a multitude of holistic uh, financial estate and succession tax efficiency and investment management solutions um, together under one umbrella for all of our clients across the globe. Uh, we've been partnered with Latitude for quite some time. And due to uh, an ever increasing number of requests from existing clients uh, for more information on this topic, we decided to set it up in a webinar format and help as many people as we possibly can. So I'll hand over to Dom and Alex shortly, um, who will soon share some insights on this. But just a couple of quick notes. We will be having a live Q&A session at the end, um, at the end of this presentation. So please feel free to type in any questions that you have in the chat box. Uh, we'll try to cover as many as we can at the end, but of course that is time dependent. Uh, at the end as well, we'll also discuss the next steps if you'd like to find out more and if you wish to uh, move on to a one-to-one one -one consultation. So we'll cover all of those points as we go. Uh, so. Dom, Alex, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much for joining today. I know that everyone is excited. We've already had some positive feedback before this even started. So looking forward to learning more, finding out more, and uh, I'll hand over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jared. So I'll now proceed with the slides. Let me just double check that my system is working. Okay. One second here. So I'll skip through. So on, on the agenda here, so I, I won't do my intro as Jared has kindly done that. So um, the order of play is going to be as follows. Introduction to our company and the investment migration industry. I'll then um, talk about Caribbean citizenship by investment, um, which is very popular um, in, in West Africa. Um, my largest client base is, is Nigeria. Um, we have an office on Victoria Island, which I'm visiting uh, more frequently. Um, then I'll talk about European residency by investment and then I'll hand it over to my colleague Alex to talk about inbound investment and residency in the UK through our unique offering. Okay so a little overview of the firm so um, specifically investment migration specialists um, we, in terms of our membership of the IMC, um, we actually hold uh, two positions. Uh, the IMC is the um, sort of self-appointed um, regulatory board of, uh, of the industry, um, which really looks to unify um, the industry's stakeholders, um, influence best practices, and um, really a, a, an essential role is also lobbying um, in, in the EU Commission um, for the industry. So we are representatives in the Caribbean um, through our Cayman office and also in the Middle East through our largest office in Dubai. We also have a, um, a government advisory arm of the, of the group. So not only do we have the private client side, which I'm responsible for, um, we have key members of the group who will go into governments and um, advise on how governments should structure and framework these important FDI raising initiatives. Um, 2,000 plus successful clients um, collectively um, with the uh, exec team. We have many pioneers of the industry, uh, Eric Major, um, we have Chris Willis, John Green. Um, so a very healthy uh, collective experience. And in terms of a group, uh, we have 10 years of operation. So, um, we have four main pistons in the group. We have uh, London, where myself, Alex, um, the CEO, Eric Major, and a few other colleagues are based. We have Malta. Um, we have the UAE, Dubai, which is our, um, our largest office. And we also have recently opened our North America office in Los Angeles 
to service the, um, I'd probably say over a thousand percent increase in inquiries from North America. So a quick uh, look at our global presence, um, rather far reaching in terms of, um, you know, where we're represented and, and where our offices are. So um, a little bit about the government advisory success. So as I said, some of the key members of the group have actually been involved in implementing these programs. Um, most notably, Eric, um, in his previous role before he set up Latitude, um, was heavily involved in uh, Malta's um, individual, inv individual investor program. Um, so um, actually helped set that up, and, and that program is really viewed as um, the sort of uh, top tier um, European citizenship by investment solution. So just a little timeline there, if you can see different um, programs we've been involved, in, uh, involved with over um, a span of, of many years. Okay, let's have a little look at the industry. So um, investment migration is a very specific area of immigration, okay? You'll probably be familiar with other routes of immigration. Um, so student visas, uh, spouse um, sponsorship, uh, work visas, those are all non-investment. So we do not advise, we do not facilitate those. Um, we obviously have uh, networks to do so, but we are specifically investment migration specialists. So the three main propositions here, you have residency by investment, very important to distinguish between these two streams of investment migration because a lot of people who don't understand it, just really pull it into one. Um, for example, you'll get people calling residency by investment programs, citizenship by investment programs, which is not the case. So as you can read there from the, um, you know, the sort of summary of each uh, category, just give you some examples. Um, residency by investment is where you acquire status in another country. Um, usually there are physical presence requirements. So the country will say, you know, you've got to spend a certain amount of days here per year to maintain your status. This status gives you um, working rights, living rights, educational rights, okay? Um, key programs, if you're talking about residency by investment, you're talking Portugal, Malta, Ireland, UK, um, you know, really European centric. Um, so, um, and also if we're talking North America, EB5, um, which is still the largest in terms of inbound applications in the USA and also um, Canada. And a lot of um, inquiries from certainly Nigeria, um, they come to me looking for the North American solution and quite often um, decide to, to go elsewhere just because they don't fully understand the onerous requirements for these uh, programs. Secondly, we have citizenship by investment. This is what keeps me very busy. Um, facilitated CBI for many, 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 many Nigerian families over the last four years. Um, I'll dive into um, the, the, the Caribbean um, because these are the most popular programs. Um, but a key difference from residency is just status in a country. Citizenship, you are acquiring full direct citizenship um, with a far shorter timeline. Um, sort of six to eight months. Okay, um, so residency, citizenship, two different things. Obviously, with citizenship, you're also getting a passport. Residency, you'll be getting a, um, a card, a visa card, usually lasts five years, like a driving license, and you just exp um, renew on expiry. Um, the third category we have is tax residency. Um, surprisingly, tax residency as a motivation is actually quite far down um, what our clients um, need or, or come to us for. Um, it's obviously something that needs to be talked about with relocating um, because I know in certain jurisdictions the knowledge of taxation is, is very low, certainly in West Africa. Um, you do not automatically become a tax resident by becoming a citizen, right? You only have that obviously in the likes of US, I think Estonia, um, but you, really, you only trigger taxation if you're in a jurisdiction for, uh, say, 183 days or more. So if you are doing a citizenship by investment program, you will not automatically become liable for taxation in that country. Residency by investment, maybe, because you might be spending enough time there. And also certain residency by investment programs, 
you will want to be a tax resident because they are very efficient, such as Portugal, such as Jersey, where I'm from in the Channel Islands, and Alex. Um, quick historical overview, um, a huge industry, you see that you know, almost 22 billion um, a year that's, that's growing, um, sorry, is it a market cap and all, is growing by 23% a year. Um, you can see a nice little graphic there of, of the timeline, um, St Kitts and Nevis being the very first, uh, which was then actually restructured into a far more framework program. Um, and um, yeah, you can see up to sort of 2019 Montenegro, uh, Anguilla, which um, Anguilla was actually um, a consortium uh, that, that we set up, uh, which is a tax residency program. Just some quick fun facts for you. And the graphic on the right, um, because a lot of people are surprised at the increase in demand from the US, uh, we have a, a North American um, sort of chart there um, because it's just really taken the, um, the industry by storm um, for many different reasons. I won't go into that because obviously the audience today isn't US, um, but just an interesting thing to throw in there because some of you might be thinking, oh, you know, I want to do um, a residency by investment program to the US. Ironically, we're helping many people diversify their residency and money out of the US. Just some quick graphics there of, of the market. Um, RBI, you can see the numbers in RBI are, are, are larger than, than CBI. Um, you can see there Portugal. Um, we are very, 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 very busy with Portugal. Um, it's a cracking program. Um, and um, yeah, lots of uh, South African nationals actually um, we've been helping with um, with their second residency in Portugal. So uh, why do clients come to us? What are the motivations? Why would you want to be spending anywhere from 150,000 US to 1.5 million euros to um, equip yourself with a second residency or second citizenship? Security, we have this uh, cutesy um, smile, which is quite a good way of, of reminding us of what are the main motivations. Mobility, um, mobility is a massive factor for the West African market. As I'm sure many of you will be aware and have experienced the issues with having a very limiting passport, um, mobility is a massive factor um, because by acquiring a second citizenship, you are acquiring a second passport, giving you visa-free travel to anywhere from 143 to 157 countries. Okay, so mobility is a massive motivation, certainly in Nigeria. Uh, investment, you know, people now wanting to diversify their asset base. Again, sorry to talk about Nigeria, but I'm obviously very uh, well versed in the market. Um, you know, a very crippling currency. Uh, we set up accounts in different jurisdictions so that they can um, funnel their US earnings into a US account offshore or, you know, for example, in a Caribbean country because they've, they've got citizenship there. Um, lifestyle and health, you know, uh, that's actually a big one for, for South Africa. Um, you know, sitting in a lovely ranch, estate, you know, power cuts still occurring. Why? You know, I, I've made this money, I've worked hard and I'm still living in the bare necessities aren't quite there. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, Portugal laps up a lot of uh, disgruntled South Africans. A very important one there. And um, if there's lot of, lots of family members here or, you know, you have large families, education, um, <clears throat> as Alex will say, a real pull factor to, to, to London or the UK is education, um, you know, uh, acquiring status in the UK, moving your, your um, family to the UK and the children actually taking advantage of the world-class education. Okay, so what I'll do is, um, I'll, I'm gonna dive into um, the uh, Caribbean programs, okay? So you have, you have five programs, okay? And if I go to this graphic over here, I'll, I'll come back to some of these. Um, so you can see in the red, you have um, citizenship by investment programs, which are highlighted. So let's look at the, the Caribbean. Um, so what is the main drive of these programs in terms of why, why are we having month on month, numerous uh, accelerated inquiries from West Africa for these five small islands um, in, in the Caribbean? Well, what these programs offer you 
is a second citizenship and therefore a second passport. <clears throat> Why is this valuable? Well, like I said at the start, global mobility is a massive value point, okay? Um, having a second passport to pick up your bags and fly to Europe, 26 uh, members of the Schengen, um, both uh, accessing new markets for business, um, for you know, simple um, you know, leisure time for your family. Um, all of these programs, in terms of what they offer with their passport power, they all have the Schengen area in the EU. They all have key destinations in Asia, such as Hong Kong, Singapore. They all have the UK. What do they give you in terms of what can you do with this um, visa-free access? It allows you to visit this country. You can't move to this country. You can't live in this country. But at the moment, depending on your passport, you can't even get there without, you know, trying to fill out a, a visa um, application. You know, you might get a five, ten-year UK visa. A lot of my clients from Nigeria say, "Look, I'm done with the hassle of that. I want a second passport so that I don't have to think about." Uh, having to renew visas. So it allows you to visit these countries typically um, uh, for, for, for 90 days in a, in a 180 day period. So if you're there for 90 days, you then have to leave for 90 days before going back. Um, in, in the UK, uh, you can actually stay there for half of the year because of the Commonwealth link with these uh, Caribbean countries. So UK is always a massive um, conversation point. And uh, myself and Alex are based in London and we receive many. Uh, many clients from West Africa who come over. Um, in terms of what, how do you uh, invest in these countries? Okay, you have uh, two options. You either make a contribution to a specific fund that has been set up to raise capital for infrastructure expenditure. Okay, so a national transformation fund, um, a national economic diversification fund, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, this is obviously a contribution. So you're not getting anything back, you're contributing to the country, okay? Um, option two, that some have more than two, but these two are the main options, is a, uh, a real estate investment, okay, in a government approved area. So <clears throat> the government will identify key um, holiday resorts, okay? Um, you will become either a shareholder in, in a hotel, or you will buy, um, you know, single title freehold lease, and you will own a, um, a suite in a, in a resort in Antigua. Um, which are the most popular? What, what do most of my clients do? Most of them opt for the contribution. Why? Um, the capital outlay is less. Certainly in in many areas in uh, West Africa, um, because of the issues with currencies and for, foreign exchange. Um, clients are very price conscious um you know i think looking the other day um one us gets you around 580 uh, naira so you know kind of thinking right how do i how do you know what's the best price essentially okay so the contribution will bring that down because obviously if you're investing in real estate you're investing far more anywhere from 200 to 400,000 plus depending on the program um Obviously, uh, with a contribution, you're parting with your money. So some clients say, oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, I want to be able to recoup my investment. Fine. If you have the money, let's put it into a, a unit in the Caribbean. But you have to, you can't touch it for five, seven years, depending on the program. So if you're happy to tie up that 200,000, okay, what's that, 30, 40 million naira, uh, maybe more actually, um, in, in, in a... Um, in a unit, okay, for five or seven years, we can sometimes have arrangements where there will be annual yield on that, usually three to 5%, um, and you do have the opportunity to recoup that after the holding period. Um, but some clients say, no, I could use that money elsewhere, um, it, either in a local um, product, you know, where I'm based, um, and they don't, you know, time value, you know, against money. Um, so we have these conversations at the start of the consultation, which is very important, um, based on budget, based on investment ethos. Um, but yeah, I'd say 95% of my clients will go for the simple contribution, done and dusted, um, and no need to think about this asset you have in a country that you might never visit. Which brings me on to my second point, um, the flexibility of these programs. Um, there is no requirement to move to these countries. You don't even have to um, visit these countries apart from Antigua after you get citizenship. 
The whole process is done by us, your licensed agent. We build your file, we submit your file, we monitor the file, and then we issue the uh, the decision. Um, obviously, some clients say, "Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm now a citizen of this lovely country called St Kitts and Nevis. I'll go and you know pay a visit." Um, but uh, but there's no there's no requirement. So um, many clients say, "Look, I'm not quite ready to leave my home country yet." Um, either because they're very well established in business or you know kids are still enjoying it there, but they have the option. They have this option with their second passport for mobility and an insurance policy. The old saying, two is better than one, really does apply now. Since the pandemic, um, you know, geopolitical tensions, um, being able to leave your country at a drop of a hat, stay in another country for three months, six months, or even move to your country of new citizenship full time is obviously a very um, important um, attribute or value point um, to, to people's lives now. And that is where, that's why we're now partnering with people like, uh, with, with firms like Carrick, um, because it's becoming a, a bolt on to a conversation about financial planning, um, diversifying your, your citizenship, diversifying your, your residency, just like you would with your investments, you diversify into different assets. This is what we're advising. Um, so that is the um, the, the uh, Caribbean options. You can see there we also have um, Austria. So, so you also have, let's go back to, to this hierarchy status. So uh, oh, let me just back. <clears throat> okay, so that, that's Caribbean CBI to one side. Now we're looking at immigration status as a whole. So you have at the bottom there, you have temporary residency. So this is where in Portugal, in the UK, after making your investment, you become a temporary resident, which means that you can live, work, study there. You might have travel privileges. For example, in Portugal, if you're a resident, you get a Schengen visa, same in Malta. This means that you can only live in, um, in Portugal or Malta, but you can travel through the Schengen, okay? That's temporary status in Portugal, which means you have to keep renewing that until either you become a permanent resident or a citizen. Next up, you have permanent residency. Um, same rights, it just means that you're permanent now, you don't have to keep renewing a visa, okay? For example, um, with Alex's um, uh, UK Innovator visa, after three years, if you fulfill the requirements, you can become a permanent resident. Next up, we have just citizenship. So this would be categorized as, for example, in the Caribbean, okay? And then at the top there, we have EU citizenship. Why is this at the top? If you are a citizen of the EU, which I was pre-Brexit, um, I was able to reside, settle, move in any of the EU, EU's 27 member states, okay? Um, so for example, if you became a citizen of Portugal, you would have this right. If you became a citizen of Malta, you would have this right. So um, it's really seen as the, the, the sort of tier, top tier um, uh, level of, of citizenship. Um, but it typically comes at a cost, um, you know, for a single applicant looking to Malta, um, you know, you're gonna part with the best, uh, with the best part of um, 900,000 euros. Um, Portugal, um, depending on, again, Portugal isn't a direct citizenship by investment program, but after five years, there's an option to be naturalized, which is why it's become so popular. Um, so Portugal, anywhere from sort of 350 to, to five, 600,000, depending on the investment you, you, you um, decide on. So um, yeah, that's a quick uh, overview of, of the status or the, the hierarchy of, of, of status. Fast forward through these. Okay, um, now I'll go on to residency by investment. Okay, so um, we have the, the, the main um, the main residency by investment programs to keep us busy are Portugal, Malta, the UK, um, Ireland. Still, um, Ireland has an, a very uh, attractive proposition. Um, and these programs, like I said, you're not becoming a direct citizen, okay? You're becoming a temporary resident or a permanent resident, but the appeal of these or what, what 
kind of profile of client would choose this over a Caribbean program. Um, this would be a client who is um, potentially thinking that they need to make the move sooner than later. Okay, so for example, with the UK, you're going to be expected to be spending most of your time in the UK each year as their requirements. Therefore, you're going to relocate there. Um, the main drivers or factors of, of why why would you choose an RBI program in Europe? Again, it's education for the for the children. It's maybe greater political stability, um, lifestyle. Um, so you're really at some point moving there, or you're you're at least visiting it every now and then um, to take advantage of what it has to offer as a country. Versus Caribbean CBI, you're becoming a, a citizen. You're getting the status. You're getting the passport. But you're not necessarily going to be um, using the country, okay? Um, RBI, you're really you're choosing the country because you want to suck up, you know, what it has to offer. Um, but also, you have the additional value, such as Portugal and Malta, of it being in the Schengen, because you also have the travel card as well as being a resident. Um, so you have, um, yeah, we have sort of price points there. Um, yeah, Canada has a, a startup visa. Um, which is um, again quite onerous. You know, you'd have to um, embark on on uh, sort of matchmaking of a client's profile. You have to have a business background. So you have really two sort of versions of residency by investment programs. You have quite passive programs um, such as Portugal, where you, all you're going to do is make an investment into a fund, or you're going to make an investment into real estate. This is passive because you're not having to actively run the um, uh, run the capital. Um, you know, it's potentially earning a passive income on the side for you, versus these more startup visas, business visas, which um, Alex is involved with in the UK and Canada, uh, where there is going to be a bit of uh, human capital. You're going to have to, you know, relocate to, you know, help the business grow. Uh, but again, that suits certain clients. Some entrepreneurial clients really want to do that. And London is, is really a, a hot spot for innovation. Um, and um, yeah, it continues to, to increase year on year. <clears throat> okay, let me just uh, skip through these. <clears throat> so just a bit about, like I was saying, you know, with the challenge, um, COVID really uh, accelerated uh, the need for, for second citizenship. Um, uh, for example, again, in the, in the US, um, what happened was many US nationals, their visa-free access was cut from being one of the most powerful passports to sort of 30, 40 countries, because many countries such as Europe were not letting US nationals in because of the optics of how badly they dealt with COVID. So we, had, we sucked up a lot of this need for travel by helping US nationals invest into um, these Caribbean islands <clears throat> and getting a second uh, second citizenship. Um, so just a bit about the solutions which I've uh, spoken about, um, but to sort of go one step further with, um, you know, how we are bolting onto this financial planning um, sort of conversation. Um, is, you know, it really is a holistic um, sort of consultation. You know, it's, it's a part of your financial planning now. Um, and um, with some programs, it's not just the immigration advice that we provide. We also bring in, you know, tax advisors, um, the education consultants, which is very important in the UK. Um, so it's a real confluence of all of these um, financial planners, um, which really, you know, brings about this 360 uh, consultation and, and, and turnkey solution, um, which, you know, over the last, I'd say, 18 months, we're getting more, uh, we're getting closer to the kind of asset management and financial planning uh, landscape, <clears throat> so much so that um, financial planners are now approaching us saying, our clients mention these golden visas or second citizenships. We don't know anything about them, um, so please, can you can you help? So, I think this is just going to increase year on year um, because people are more conscious about where they want their capital to, to to be situated, where they want to be situated, 
Um, so this is why partnerships with the likes of Carrick are, are very important. Um, a quick idea of, of the client journey. So the, the initial consultation is very important. Um, a day to day for me, um, we have a large business to business network, ref client referrals, um, who they'll put themselves in contact with me. Um, luckily, because of COVID, people don't mind doing Zoom calls now for meetings. Um, we tend to travel a fair amount. Um, like I said, I was in Nigeria last month. I'll be in Cape Town um, <clears throat> next Wednesday to Saturday. So if anyone wants to come uh, for, for a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, let me know or, or let us know after the meeting. Um, but we're able to do these consultations over the phone or, or over Zoom, um, where we really try and funnel down um, what clients or prospective clients should be looking at, because it's a minefield of information. Um, and for me, what does it come down to? It comes down to budget. It comes down to what do they really want? You know, do they really want to live in that country or, or do they want to stay in their host country, home country, and just have different privileges? So often a client will come to me saying, I want Grenada. And then I'll discuss the nuances between the programs and they'll end up going for Portugal, for example. <clears throat> um, we then have, once you become a client, um, we then have um, a, a, a large, our, our processing team is actually based in our largest office, which is in Dubai. We have around 50 staff there who are um, tasked with building your file. So you can imagine these uh, bureaucratic agencies as governments are, large files you have to go through filling out. We do this all on behalf of the, uh, the client. Um, we build the file. Um, so, so we mount and compile the file. We then submit the file to the government. Um, for a Caribbean program, we wait anywhere from 90 to 100 day, 120 days for the government to um, process the due diligence. We then get a result, and this is where the investment or the contribution is due. So these programs are really um, pulled over a you know one to seven month journey with certain points in the journey is when payments are due. For example, once you become a client, we will charge a retainer so that you know we're contractually obliged and we're working on your file. Tranche two would typically be um, our, the balance of our fee for mounting your file. Uh, it would be the government's fees because the governments obviously charge their own fees, due diligence, processing, password issuance. And then 90 to 120 days later, the balance of the investment or the full contribution is due. So um, these total figures of, you know, let's say for the Caribbean, you can do it for around 170,000 US for a family of four. That's mum, dad, and two children, minor children under the age of 16. That 165, 170,000 figure is really pulled over six months. Um, we also have post landing services. So um, you know, we, we obviously host clients when they come, if, if, for example, if they're coming to the UK, we host, if they're coming to Malta, if they're coming to uh, Portugal, um, we have a, a, almost like a concierge service where we'll show you the real estate, um, which is obviously a very important um, aspect of the client journey. We also have um, post citizenship solutions. You want us to set up a company, you want us to set up a USP account. Um, you want us to renew your password in five, 10 years, all of these um, solutions. And uh, just a, so that's the executive team. Uh, always very proud to um, show this slide because of uh, you know, the depth of knowledge and <clears throat> credibility these guys have. Uh, so Eric, um, the, the industry actually started in Canada in the 1990s. Um, they had a residency by investment program and Eric was uh, MD of HSBC, and he was um, he, he was he headed up the the product um, for buying the um, uh, the corporate bond. Uh, sorry, the, the government bond. Okay, so they they had to work with the government to to establish the accounts and also set up an instrument where you could finance the bond to bring down the total cost. So Eric has 25, 30 years in the in the industry, has set up programs around the world. Um, we then have Mamoon. So um, our largest office is in Dubai. Um, it is um, 
we acquired the company in 2018, which really accelerated our growth. Um, so Mamoon is the CEO of that office. Um, they are the largest um, investment migration advisory uh, in the Middle East. Um, uh, Mamoon is a, uh, I think he's a French, he's French St. Lucian, and um, what's the third one? Not sure what the third one is actually, but um, he, oh, Moroccan. Um, David Reguero, the COO, he's a Spaniard. He's also based in our, in our um, Dubai office. We have Chris, another a Canadian. Um, he's been involved in, he, he heads up the government advisory. Um, so he's very knowledgeable, been in the industry for many years. John Green, another Canadian based in, in Vancouver. Um, again, very experienced. And Ryan it heads up our Malta office. So we have a fantastic team. Um, there as well. Um, so yeah, mindful of time, um, just on time at the moment, which is good. Um, so I think the audience today will majority, the majority of the audience will probably, um, their eyes will be looking or they'll be uh, perked up at the sound of, of, of CBI, I think, Citizenship by Investment, um, just because of my experience um, in West Africa of the demand for this. Um, we are expanding through Africa. Ghana is now becoming um, a market that is looking for these services. Um, but um, yeah, if you're looking to improve your global mobility, to access new markets, if you're looking to have an insurance policy, um, then you know citizenship by investment is very important. If you're looking to have a second residency so that your children can go to um, better schools, um, you feel that your country isn't serving your needs anymore, political instability, then we talk about European um, RBI, and um, I will now hand this over to Alex, who will talk about a very important RBI program, uh, which is the Inbound UK. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Dom. You've been uh, incredibly comprehensive. So it falls to me to speak about something a bit more specific, um, exactly as Dom mentioned, you know, that our approach is very holistic in terms of understanding um, people's uh, preferences and, and, and understanding as much about their circumstances as possible and ultimately for people who imagine themselves moving to the UK and availing themselves of one of a, a variety of different um, immigration uh, options to the UK um, though those are changing all the time um, this uh, kind of landscape of, of options available to them um, then uh, you might want to consider actually coming to the UK, moving to the UK with your family, and therefore will be wanting to understand what, what, what are the options available to me. So one of those options, um, which I want to mention uh, today, is called the Innovator Visa. Um, and the Innovator Visa is um, something that's quite interesting. Um, and I think Don Murray mentioned it. It provides this pathway to permanent residence in the UK over a period of three years. Um, which is, which actually gives it really, really a lot of uh, attractive um, uh, aspects. Um, however, it does come with some challenges. It's not uh, uh, just automatically granted. Um, you, there are definitely some hurdles that you need to overcome as part of the process of, of applying and also of converting that uh, temporary visa into permanent residence in this three-year period. Um, and so I want to kind of go through those uh, those aspects with you today and explain a bit more about it. Again, I'm not necessarily sure that this will be the perfect solution for everyone in the school, but it's just one uh, option that is available for people who want to come to the UK. So in terms of what is required for someone who wants to come to the UK and use this Innovator Visa uh, as the tool that is going to bring them here, um, what do you need? Well, fundamentally, in order to apply for the visa, you need to be a founding member of a startup, and that startup needs to demonstrate three characteristics to the satisfaction of the government. It needs to show that it is innovative, viable, and scalable. So these are the three words the government uses. So innovative, what does that mean? Well, it needs to be something that's different or has some unique competitive advantage. Viability, well, that need, especially means uh, it needs to be realistic and achievable. And there's a, a number of ways of breaking that down, uh, but typically it means um, financially uh, viable as well as kind of intellectually viable. Can this team of people, do they have the necessary skills, resources, experience to get this job done? And finally, is this idea, business plan scalable? Is there a potential for job creation, growth, and ultimately can this business plan be uh, commercially successful, profitable. So you might ask yourself, well, perhaps I have an idea. Perhaps I think my idea applies to all these different characteristics. So who, how, how does this work? Well, the, this next part is very important. 
these three things are assessed by what's called an endorsing body. So the endorsing bodies are these government approved organizations who are appointed by the government for this express purpose of receiving prospective uh, business plans from potential innovators and deciding do these plans meet these criteria. So there's over 50 of them at the moment, although this number is expected to change in the future. Um, and they, they come from a really wide um, array of, of different uh, sectors. There are some that are universities, of course, who are going to be working with their alumni from their business schools. Uh, there are some that are um, um, venture capital companies. There are some that are incubators. All of them really have experience in, in, in supporting and working with small businesses. Um, and they can also pick and choose who they want to work with. So they can specify, oh, we only want to work with people in specific industries that we have expertise in. Uh, or in specific locations. Maybe we only want to work with people in Scotland or Cornwall or whatever that happens to be. Um, so they have a really, really important role in this visa category. They are responsible for receiving these business plans, deciding if someone's plan meets these criteria. And if it does, what they do is they issue what's called a letter of endorsement, which is actually what allows you to apply for the visa. But they don't just have a, a, a very important role at the start. They have a very important role throughout the course of the visa. For the entire three years, they're going to be supporting the business and also monitoring the business on behalf of the government. So they really are these kind of uh, gatekeepers to this visa category. Another important thing you need when you are applying for this visa is you need to demonstrate sufficient language skills. I'm not going to go too far into this, but it's it's just a kind of routine uh, requirement. The level as set by the government is called B2, which is considered an intermediate level. Um, and there are a variety of ways of either demonstrating you have that level already through some form of qualification that you hold, or by, of course, taking a test. And the final thing you need when you apply for the visa, visa sorry, is um, to demonstrate sufficient settlement funds and no surprises to pay the fees to apply. So that's a kind of whistle-stop tour in terms of uh, the application process. Um, the second hurdle, once you actually have the visa, so you've got the visa now, you've applied, uh, you've got the support from your endorsing body, uh, and now you're on this three-year journey to permanent residence. And so now the next thing I want to go through is these criteria for converting that temporary visa into permanent residence after three years. So what is required? Well, in terms of what the government uh, expresses a, a desire to see from uh, innovators, they give different re requirements for the innovator themselves, as well as for their business. And so let's go through each one of these now. Well, initially, the innovator, again, in the third year, needs to demonstrate an active role in the business. They need to be a director, and they need to be absent for no more than 180 days in any 12 month period. So you can tell already, this is not for someone who's just gonna be coming every now and again, this is for someone who's gonna actually have a significant amount of time spent in the UK. In terms of what is necessary for the business, the business must be registered, must be active, must be sustainable. So it needs to have some money in the account coming in, going out, it needs to exist. Uh, and this final one's the most important. Together, the innovator and the business must demonstrate having fulfilled two out of seven achievements that have been created and designed by the government. So this is very interesting. This is now you can tell right away what is what it is what is the government looking for from these businesses? What do they think makes a successful innovative company? Well, let's go through them. So the first one is: Did you invest more than fifty thousand pounds into the business? So if you did that, then you've got one of those achievements right away. So what are the rest? Well, the next two relate to revenue, either a million pounds in revenue or half a million with 20% or 100,000 from overseas export. The next one is, did you apply for intellectual property? So this is generally considered to be something like a patent. The next two relate to jobs, either five full-time jobs with an average salary of 25,000 pounds a year, or if the salary is lower, then you need 10 full-time jobs. And the final one's a little bit a little strange. Um, the last one is, did the number of customers of the business double over those three years? And is it higher than the average number of customers for other UK businesses offering comparable products or services? So what this frequently leads to is a little bit of a misunderstanding, actually. And so that's what kind of the next thing I want to go through. Um, frequently, when I'm speaking to people about this um, visa category, they say to me, oh, Alex, yeah, yeah I, I know the Innovator visa. That's the £50,000 visa, right? And the truth is, it's a little bit more complicated because, as I just read, and you'll have heard me say, one of those criteria is, did you have £50,000 invested into your business? And that is one of these criteria, one out, of, one out of the two that you need of the seven that the government has prescribed. So that's one thing. The second thing is that when you're actually applying for the visa, 
you will actually need to demonstrate to the government that you have more than £50,000 under your control in order to qualify. But the part of the equation that is missing in what I just, just described is the fact that it is the exclusive uh, role of the endorsing body to determine if a business is viable. And again, that also comes down to financial viability. So typically what we see from the endorsing bodies is they want to understand, okay, you know, what, whatever your idea is, we want to understand how this idea is viable. And, and, and they're not gonna, they're not gonna stick to some rigid, rigid 50,000 pounds. They're gonna say, well, explain to me how, how this business is viable. Have you, have you thought about 12, 18, 24 months runway until your business is starting to generate revenue and starting to be profitable and starting to pay for itself? So the next thing and the final thing I want to explain is uh, about our, our proposition, our approach and how we support people who are interested in uh, this uh, visa category. And exactly as Don mentioned, we have some, a part of that which is a little bit unusual and unique. And that's what I'm going to explain next. So one of the things that we do to support clients who come into the UK in this way is a service that we call matchmaking. So what does that mean? Well, we in this situation are assessing our client's profile and their background and their experience and their skills and we're introducing them to a portfolio of what we think are gonna be suitable pre-revenue, pre-trading ventures. So all of these are companies that have developed some sort of product or service, they haven't yet commercialized, and that's very important because if, you, if a new person is gonna come on board and is gonna call themselves a founder, then they have to join at the right time. And these companies are of course ready and willing to accommodate a new person onto their founding team. Why, why is that so attractive? Well. Initially, of course, because there's going to be some sort of investment involved. There's going to be an equity investment. So our, my, my client is going to invest in this business and become an equity shareholder in, and actually own a percentage of this business. How much? Of course, it's negotiated. But they're also, because of the way that the Innovator Visa works and the fact that you must be actively contributing and supporting this business, they're also going to get what we call their human capital. What does that mean? It means some of their time and their effort in actually supporting the business and helping the business to be successful. In general, the way this is structured is that these businesses are seeking an investment of more than 250,000 pounds. So totally separate from the 50,000. And there's a few reasons why, and if anyone's interested in this, I can kind of break those reasons down and explain uh, how this is structured and the salary and all the kind of stuff um, to go through it in, in, in more detail. So yeah, under this process, we're really um, assessing the profile and, and introducing a portfolio. We have in, at any one time between 30 and 40 different companies in different areas, in different sectors, in different industries. But the most important thing is that if we don't have something immediately that is suitable or matches, um, we're gonna go out and look and find and, and explore uh, other options for our clients. Uh, thereafter, we're gonna be arranging multiple meetings, hoping to make a kind of chemistry and a match and a synergy and for these people to go on to create hopefully a successful business. Um, once that match is made, we're then uh, seeking endorsement and of course applying for the visa. The other thing we do, and the final thing I want to mention is uh, about sort of supporting someone with their own idea. So, so, so if, of course, if someone has their own business idea and would like to come to the UK and they say, yeah, I have an idea of my, my business that is innovative and viable and scalable, how can you help? Well, absolutely, we can, we can support that person in coming to the UK to engage in that idea. What does that look like? Well, of course, it means firstly and initially um, undertaking some sort of critical assessment of the business plan and idea to ensure that we all agree that it, it has what it takes in terms of these three aspects. I'm gonna say them one, more fi one final time. Is the business innovative and viable and scalable? Potentially, that also could involve introducing someone to uh, business partners or associates um, especially when, especially because when you're coming to the UK um, and you're needing needing to demonstrate having uh, an idea with sufficient gravitas, you need to be able to show not just that you have some wonderful new app or, or invention. Uh, you know, those things aren't a company. A company is actually uh, the relationships and the uh, the manufacturers and the suppliers and the people you're actually be working on a day-to-day -day basis with. And once that's, once that's done, we're going to then together be building a business plan that includes all the things you'd expect from a business plan, always refer referring back to these three traits. I'm not going to say them again. And then finally, once that business plan is finalized, we're going to get that business plan endorsed and, of course, apply for the visa. And I think that's me done. Well, Dom, Alex, thank you very much. You went through... Uh fantastic uh, presentation there and it's nice to have a sort of overview from you Dom and then something you know a specific kind of approach Alex so that's very helpful but of course there's a lot more to explore you know by means of different options uh, you know unpacking um, as, as we go because everyone as you say Alex 
might need a different kind of solution. Um, I'm just checking for, for, for time now. I think some questions have come through. Um, but if I can just ask one first, um, Alex, with this innovative visa, how has the, 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 the traffic really been? You know, have you seen an increase in um, sort of number of applicants for it? Is that sort of brand new or how, how is that looking? It's a really good question. It's a really good question, Jared. Um, so the, the, the truth is that the immigration um, landscape in the UK is complicated. And over the last six months, especially, there have been a number of, uh, of really significant changes to the way that some visa categories work, and they've even taken away uh, some others. So, the, so this, is, this is a constantly um, evolving landscape. And, and especially the reason why it's so important to actually engage with an advisor to, to help you, uh, you know, because it's one thing, you know, looking up static pages on a website of, of some of some program. But again, these things are constantly changing, especially in the UK. Um, so in the UK, there was another visa called the investor visa, um, which facilitated a, a, a kind of more straightforward, uh, if I'm honest, um, pathway to permanent residence. It was just through the way of a, a, an, an investment uh, in a very prescribed way in stocks and shares and bonds. But that was basically closed. In, in February, the government said that we're going to close that. Um, there were some other options, including what was called a sole representative visa. That was also closed. Um, so there's definitely um, been more attention towards the innovative visa. It's, it's, it's just had its third anniversary. So it's still relatively new. Um, and, and we're actually expecting more changes uh, later in the year to this visa category, potentially making it a bit more uh, um, uh, diverse in terms of what, what is allowed in terms of investments. Um, but who knows, these things are always temporary, always an idea until the government actually announces and, and actually formalizes that. Um, so yeah, the number, of, the number of applications is increasing year on year, quarter on quarter. Um, with the innovative visa, there are going to be some changes later in the year to the way that the endorsing bodies works um, at work, and uh, there's also going to be a reduction in the number of those endorsing bodies, which is going to have some impact. Um, but again, you know, the, we've, we've been doing this a long time, so we, we know this industry very well, and, and we can react to these types of changes and, and give our clients the best advice in terms of how you navigate this and, and, and what steps you need to take. Yeah, that's perfect, Alex. Uh, you know, as, as you were going through this, um, it just highlights the, the actual point of, you know. We all come across clients every day of who say to us, "I'm looking at options like this. How how do we do it?" And that's why you know we've partnered with you. I think it's fantastic to actually speak to the experts on the ground. You, you know, uh, because it is quite a maze to actually na actually navigate. Sort of first of all, where to start, and then whichever maze you you do choose, actually have that yeah. guard the the exactly. whole way. That's very, very important. You know, by means of frustration levels and time frame. You know, it's nice to know that you have an expert guarding you every step of the way. Um, just one thing, just as I'm watching the time here, uh, before we end up, you can see everyone who's on the call today. Thanks again for, for logging in. Um, a lot of people, as I said earlier, and a lot of information to unpack on an individual basis. So we are going to try to reach out to as many people as possible. Um, you know, you can reach out to my myself, to Angela, to your CARIC representative, um, and we can schedule actually a one-to-one -one consultation. You know, you can see we work extremely closely with the likes of Dom and Alex, um, who will also be partaking in consultations as well. So if you would like a meeting sooner rather than later, you know, please feel free to type yes in, in the chat box. So it can just guide us by means of pr priority as well, um, you know, if you are ready for, for that meeting. Um, so that would be very helpful. We can reach out afterwards and, as I said, reach out again to, to us. But, um, Dom, Alex, any perhaps final words from, from either yeah. of you? Yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of questions here which I will, um, that I will answer. So, so one of them is, um, is the investment per person or per family? Um, so with these scenarios, you will have a main applicant. Okay, so the main applicant is essentially the investor, the person, remitting the funds, the person with the wealth, um, that person can then nominate dependents as long as they're eligible. For example, spouse, children, um, parents, siblings. So um, the, as a general comment, the bigger the family, the more total cost because you're adding um, family members. So the government's due diligence fees will go up. This is more, um, you know, talking about your typical CBI structure. Um, also, you know, the contribution amount will go up. For example, with Antigua, you'll get a contribution of 100,000, which covers a family of four. But if you add on a fifth family member, that'll go up to one, two, five thousand. Um, 
So there are different fees which will increase with more people, obviously. Um, so yeah, it's one person investing or making the investment who has the source of wealth, who has the um, uh, you know the, the financial capabilities with family members um, uh, tied onto the application. And, and and the definition of those family members also is not consistent. So some 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 government some Caribbean governments will say, well, we consider a family member to include dependent parents above the age of 54. Others, it's so it's so. And for example, in in my world of the of the UK Innovator Visa, um, dependents are, are very strict in in the government's uh, view, and they cut them off at 18 in terms of what they consider an eligible dependent. And there's no such thing as dependent uh, adult children, children. There's no such thing as dependent parents at least in this innovator uh, visa landscape yeah um there's a quite an important question um c c alex can you see the second one here um i can't, I can't see i can't see the I'll, question sorry i'll I read it out uh, is there invest uh talking about the uk is there investment in business to own that can lead to residents in the uk um um, well, so so again, the, the important thing, at least under the Innovator Visa, is to demonstrate that the business and the founding team that you're part of are able to meet these criteria. Um, and so you aren't able to invest in an existing business, especially one that is trading and is, is, is generating revenue, because the government will, will rightfully say, well, you, you aren't a founder of this company, you've just invested and you've joined this company after they were already uh, at the races, so to speak. Um, so yeah, this is this is this is definitely um, a situation where I'd say please get in touch with us. We'll ex we'll talk you through some of these um, different options we have available. There are there are there are ways that we can structure this in terms of subsidiaries of other companies, for example. Um, so this is this is definitely a, the, a, a potentially a start of a broader conversation. If you're interested, please get in touch with us and we, and we can actually uh, explore this in more in more depth. Mm -hmm. And there, there's one one final question actually, which is a um, which is interesting and and you know should be. Um, should be looked at um and you know is uh, many advisors will probably try and skirt this issue um we obviously approach it on a case-by-case -case scenario um but uh, i've got a question here the eu parliamentary sessions occurring have not been favorites of cbi do you think the eu um visa-free access will be scrapped the likes of the caribbean countries malta portugal um, so let me address what's going on at the moment. So the, the, the yeah, the, there's a small commission within the EU which is very politically driven. They don't like this idea of um, commoditizing citizenship, although you think of all the benefits that that brings. Okay, FDI to a country, human talent. Um, uh, you know, instead of issuing debt as a country, you're just issuing, uh, you're, you're just gaining sovereign equity. So it's a win-win for the country and it's a win for the, um, for the investor. Um, my understanding of uh, what's going on there is it's a very complex um, uh, legal process. And one of the uh, key stages in that process is um, members of parliament in each country of the EU would have to at some point vote on the motion. Um, so obviously these members of parliament in many countries that have these programs are not going to vote against it. Is, um, the two important sources of FDI. Um, will could the EU scrap Schengen access to the Caribbean passports? Yes, they could. They have that power. Um, what's happening at the moment is um, CIUs, the Citizenship by Investment Units of these countries, are in talks with um, the EU, explaining how important the FDI is, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They would really only do it, in my opinion, on the basis of if, if they sent a task force to one of the countries, like they did in Vanuatu, and they find out that the due diligence is not being done to the level it should be, then they would suspend it, and then they'd give an option to improve, like they're doing in Vanuatu. They suspended because it was a program which was kind of forced into the industry, and they were trying to be too quick with the due diligence is what we hear. So yes, they can. We can't do anything about that. Um, is it a real threat? Yes, but I still think it relies on due diligence and the conversations are going the right way. Um, if the EU is taken out, you still have you know, 130 other countries to, to be able to travel to. Um, and the insurance policy aspect now is becoming uh, as important as the global mobility. Um, we probably don't have time for any more, do we? Should we, um, or? Does it, well, does, I, I think I think Dom, if, if there is one more that um, 
that you think is, is quite important? Yeah, yeah let's go. Uh, let me just have a look. Can you da, da, da. just scrolling down? Let's do one more here. Um, okay, so so can you use a mortgage to purchase properties under these schemes? Um, so you, for example, so what would this apply to? This would apply to something like Portugal. Okay, let's say you're investing in real estate. Um, the investment needs to be made from your local account in Portugal. A key um, aspect of the program is us setting up the account for you. Um, you can't take a loan out in Portugal. You can't take a mortgage in Portugal. All of the required funds need to be in that account. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if, for example, you had a loan facility in your home country, which enabled you to um, raise these funds, as long as they were sufficient in Portugal and the investment could be made, then that is fine. Um, but in terms of if looking at other countries, um, you know, people say, are there kind of loan packages or, uh, you know, any way we could finance our application? It's investment migration. So the country has to be happy that you are financially capable of uh, pursuing a program. Okay. So, for example, in the Caribbean, they'll have to see that you have sufficient funds um, mixed between, um, you know, a current account, a corporate account, um, or, um, you know, real assets, um, because you need to show that you can you know, easily afford what what these programs require. So our typical client profile is a high net worth or an ultra high net worth. A high net worth being, um, you know, one million uh, in terms of uh, net worth, um, anywhere, you know, up to, to sort of billionaires that, that we uh, also help as well. Um, there is kind of a mass affluent market now who are quite large consumers of the um, CBI programs because the price point is less and there's no net worth requirement. Um, so, you know, someone who has sort of liquid assets of, uh, of sort of 500,000 um, can afford to um, part with 150,000 US, for example. Um, so, um, yeah, no, uh, no loan financing for, for these sort of direct programs. And in Portugal, as long as you have the required capital in your account um, and you have made the investment, you're being granted as a qualifying investment. <clears throat> Excellent, Dom. Thank you very much. Um, I think, you know, just to wind up on the questions there, um, I know that a lot more have, have come through, but just for sake of time, uh, to talk about the next steps. Okay, so for everyone who's on the call, if you um, are, are wanting, you know, further questions asked or a one-to-one -one consultation, as I said, just type in yes in, in, in the chat box. Um, we'll set that up. The next step is to have that chat, you know, just... Uh, have a general conversation around what it is you are looking for, um, how how we can help you by means of Carrick and Latitude as well. Um, and then we take it from there and we'll really sort of craft a personalized path for each and every person to, to actually follow. Okay. Um, so I think that's all by means of, of time. Alex, Dom, thank you very much again. It's been very insightful. Um, really looking forward to helping as many people as we can um, from the call today. Um, so thanks again. And thanks for everyone who joined as well. Thank you all. And uh, yeah, thank you for, for hosting, Carrick. And uh, we look forward to helping uh, many people uh, in due course. Indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Take care.